Good evening. Welcome to uh, the final Global Awareness Lecture Series program of the year. Um, I hope that you will find it uh, interesting. Just first of all, a word about what the focus is going to be tonight. Uh, the focus is a, on a term that we use a lot in political science and that we use a lot in contemporary United States political life. And that term is democracy. But we don't often in really engage that term uh, to think about what it really means, or sometimes even worse, we have very narrow definitions of what it means. Often, in fact, even in our own country, reduced to voting in elections with little sense of what democracy means beyond that. It's a horse race between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney or between candidates for Congress or the, the House of Representatives. Arnold is going to challenge you tonight to think about democracy in a broader way by focusing on Cuba, the primary focus of his research for uh, almost 20 years, and also some new Latin American democracies that are experimenting with different ways of democracy, Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador. And he'll also reflect, as he is as a Canadian, uh, the, how we think about democracy in the United States and Canada. Um, Arnold holds a master's degree in political science uh, from McGill University in Montreal. He is a Montreal-based writer, journalist, and lecturer. He has probably done more academic research on the Cuban political system called People's Power, which was instituted in the Cuban Constitution of the 1970s, than any other researcher, either Cuban or non-Cuban. He has been an observer at all the levels of the Cuban electoral process, which occurs every four and five years, and also with his last research on the most recent elections, also following the Cuban legislative process, attending the committee hearings and the like, the way that a good political scientist in the United States would study you know, how a bill becomes a law in the United States. He has done that kind of research uh, in Cuba and was really one of the first uh, to do that. The fruits of it are two books, Democracy in Cuba and the 1997-98 elections, which was his first extensive uh, field w work on the island. And now the new book, Cuba and its Neighbors, Democracy in Motion, that looks at recent Cuban elections and then extends that to field work and understanding of the election and de democratic processes um, in the Bolivarian Alliance countries um, in Latin America. I've asked him to um, speak for 45 to 50 minutes to give you some his basic thoughts about this subject, and then at that point, um, he will be open uh, to question and answer. We'll have the program hopefully tied up uh, no more than uh, 10 minutes to 9 or 9 o'clock, depending upon uh, your questions. Arnold, uh, welcome here to St. John's, St. Ben's. Thank you very much. That was a very, that was a great introduction. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a, for me, it's a privilege and an honor to be one of the many distinguished uh, guest lecturers here in the Global, Global Awareness Program. In fact, my book uh, is about global awareness. This latest book, I will, the goal is 
to contribute along with other uh, writers, activists, uh, who are dealing with the issue of the notion that the democracy cannot be viewed solely from the angle of the United States or, or from Canada at that manner. And global awareness, specifically zeroing in on one area of this globe, of this world, that is Latin America. And within that context, specifically Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador. And I would like to start by challenging, if we're going to uh, uh, try to have a, uh, a better awareness of how democracy operates in Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, we, it might be of interest to firstly examine how the so-called the model of democracy really operates in the United States of America. I have a full chapter of that. This, this is when my book is called Cuba and its Neighbors, Democracy in Motion, the neighbors of Cuba under consideration are the United States, Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador. Regarding democracy, why democracy in motion? Because my view is, as a political scientist, perhaps many of you have come to similar conclusions in watching how the world has been developing over the last few years, that we can no longer speak of democracy in a stultified structural manner. More and more people, whether it's the United States, for example, the Occupy movement, or people in Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, or in Canada, they, we are demanding more and more a democracy which means real effective political power, that people are involved directly in fashioning the, their own country the way they think it should be run. We're talking about an ongoing process, therefore democracy in motion. I'd like to start by <clears throat> challenging ourselves with regards to democracy in the United States of America. Um, in the United States, uh, whether in the United States or in Canada or in any other country in the world, we are constantly fed the notion that in the United States you have the two-party system. On the one hand, Democrats, Republican, or left versus right, or liberals versus conservatives, or in the media, in, this, in terms of the media, CNN, NBC versus Fox News. So I, I examined that question in detail. I go all the way back to the beginning of the 17th century when the initial stages of the United States came into being with the Puritans and the Pilgrims, right to the current period. In order to take this issue of the choice between the, in the two-party system supposedly as the the way of having a political system and, uh, uh, and voting, etc. I took the most challenging case, the question of Obama, what I call the Obama case study. In order to study Obama, I went back to, right to his initial speeches, from his speech on the Iraq War in 2002, to his first speech to the Democratic National Convention in 2004, to his two books, I read them completely, 2004, 2006, as well as all, as well as all, his, all of his important speeches, 2008, right to the end of 2012, just before my book was published. So I will just give you the punchline, okay, as a challenge. What my investigation has shown, and this is all documented in my book in detail, is that I do not believe, based on the facts, that the Obama is the lesser of two evils. My conclusion is, and I arrived at this conclusion at the same time as other people were doing so. For example, in the Midwest, the Occupy Chicago movement said the same thing in 2011, 2012. As well, you have, as well you have the Black Agenda Report written by Afro-American progressives in California and throughout the United States. My basic conclusion is, that Obama, far from being the lesser of the two evils, is the most effective of the two evils in applying the U.S. domestic and international policies. Okay, that's, not everyone will agree with me, but I have to tell you, when I wrote that in 2012, this book came out about a year ago, I asked myself the question, is, do, do I regret anything that I wrote in 2012, 2013, including that? My answer is no. Because if someone looks objectively at the situation with regards to the Obama administration, 
that it, it is a fact that he is able to get away with things that perhaps the Republicans would not have been able to get away with. But in any case, the, uh, the, my point in the book is, to, until when are the American people going to postpone putting off an alternative to the so-called lesser of two evils, and rather look for an alternative to the lesser of two evils, an entirely new grassroots movement which takes on, takes to task the lesser of two evils. Like the Chicago Wall Street movement clearly said that. They said, why should we cynically gob up, why should we cynically accept the notion that we have to vote for the lesser of two evils? Instead, we should look for an alternative. And many other people are increasingly think, thinking in the same way. So that is my basic thesis with regards to democracy in the United States. History is also shown from the beginning of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. The basic political system in the United States of America is based on the sanctity of, the pri of private property. That is liberty, or liberalism, is really the liberty of individuals to accumulate the maximum amount of private property as they would like. And this is only, of course, applicable to a very few people in the world, in, in the United States. Let us go on to another example, Cuba. Cuba has taken an entirely different path than the United States of America. Cuba, for example, in the 19th century, have had their own particular um, uh, tradition of participatory democracy, if you like, in the second half of the 19th century, when the independence fighters fought against Spanish occupation at that time, and right under the noses of the Spanish military, they freed liberated territories, and they elected people to a constituent assembly four different times, and they elaborated their own constitution in the second half of the 19th century, four different constitutions. And just as a backdrop to, to show a, a clear line of distinction, while the people participated in these constituent assemblies by electing members of the constituent assembly and actually elaborating on this constitution, in the United States of America, as you probably all know, most of you are uh, in political science, that the constitution of the United States was decided upon by a small handful of white, wealthy white landowners who were slave owners. That is how the Constitution of the United States was developed. And right to this time, as I show my book in detail, the question of suffrage, even, even elections, even the ability to participate in elections in the United States, which supposedly is the uh, epitome, as, as was said, in elections, is very much curtailed in the United States of America, especially against African Americans and against Latinos. But Cuba took another path. In the 1950s, the revolution that began in the 19th century was rekindled again in the 1950s, and in 19, 19, January 1st, 1959, for the first time, led by Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Raul Castro, and others, the Cuban people had a victory and they won political power for the first time in their history. And what was one of the first things that was carried out by the revolutionaries at the time? It was to start to whittle away at what? At private property. First thing, the wealthy landowners from the United States and from Cuba who controlled almost all the uh, arable land, the, the profitable land in Cuba, as well as nationalizing important American uh, and uh, industries such as in telecommunications, such as in uh, uh, telephone industries and other such industries. All these were being nationalized. And the funds from these economic entities were used instead to develop the social and cultural well-being of the Cuban pe people, such as in health and education, and the basic necessities of life. And they started to produce things so that the vast majority of people, all the people, would have at least the basic necessity of life, that is, a health, education, housing, and other cu and cultural activities as well. This was in, the 19, in 1959. And how did, how did the Cuban people decide, how, do, how were elections or political system, how were they carried out in 1959, 1960? In 1959, 1960, the question of elections came up. 
amongst the people, but especially from the United States who are pressuring Fidel Castro, well, what about elections? When are elections going to take place? In my book, my second book, I document the whole thing, that Fidel Castro actually had meetings with people on a mass basis, up to one million people in public squares. So this is why I put this on the front cover of my first book, in which there was an open debate and discussion on the issue of the elections. And the people basically say, we do not want to have elections now. Why is that? Was it that the people, Cuban people were uh, anti-democratic, they were against elections? No, because the only experience that the Cuban people had with elections before 1959 was the type of elections that was imposed by the United States when they controlled Cuba from 1901 to 1958. In that period, 1901 to 1958, Aside from a short period in the 1930s when a, a, a revolution took place, during that whole, virtually that whole decade, the, the United States basically organized things in the following way. When one party or leader or strongman was discredited, they would ditch that person and bring someone else to replace that person. And that is how they maintained that system from 19, 1901 to 1958 until the Cuban people decided to overthrow that whole system. And this is why the elections were rejected in the 1960s and the early 1970s. However, the Cubans realized that they had to have some kind of a representative government. And so they decided to work out their own political system, their own electoral system, which is entirely different. It is not the type, type of system that exists in um, in Soviet Union. Uh, what was established in 1976, firstly the people established a new constitution that was drafted by a special commission who worked out the basic articles of the constitution and this draft constitution was presented to the people for their input. And literally millions of people discussed things at this, at their place of work and their, in their educational institutions, as well as in uh, the neighborhoods, and brought in many uh, aspects that were s later uh, uh, changed in conformity to what the grassroots thoughts should be in the Constitution. A new Constitution was finally approved in a referendum in which the vast majority of the people voted, and the vast majority of the people voted in favor of that new Constitution. Now, the current electoral system that exists in Cuba, the current political system in terms of legislation, how the state works between the elections is basically founded on that 1976 constitution, even though important reforms have taken place. And I would like to explain you just to you certain aspects of how the political system operates in Cuba. But before going into elections and how the state operates between elections, I'd like to deal with one important preconceived notion. In general, people have the notion that um, Cuba is a communist country. The Communist Party of Cuba controls everything. There's no discussion. It's dead. You know, there, there's no debate or whatever. Okay? My investigation has shown that, in fact, the Communist Party of Cuba is one of the main instruments of change in Cuba one of the main instruments of provoking debate and discussion in Cuba on how to improve the political system. In other words, it's quite the opposite of what is the notion that is often fed to us. Now, the, one has to take into account in the Cuban Constitution, there are two articles that may seem contradictory. And it's important, I think, for people in political science to, to reflect upon it. This. One article says that sovereignty resides in the people. A very important thing, quite the opposite in the, from, in, compared to the American Constitution. By the way, in the American Constitution, the word democracy is not there. I dare anyone here to find the word democracy in the American Constitution. Secondly, the modern notion that sovereignty is vested in the hands of the people also cannot be found in the American Constitution. Now, the fact that sovereignty is vested in the hands of the people from which all other power is deemed to be... Uh, is, is deemed to come from, is in the Constitution. At the same time, to be quite fair, if you like, that same Constitution also says that the Communist Party of Cuba is the leading force of the nation and the revolution in Cuba. Is this a contradiction? 
I don't think so. I think the main question is not whether there's one or more parties, but whether that party in question, in this case we're talking about the Communist Party of Cuba, whether that party actual, actually in real, the real political life, does it foster and encourage the notion that sovereignty is vested in the hands of the people. So what I did, I did a study on the recent activities of the Communist Party of Cuba. People here are probably, most of you are probably familiar with the notion there are a lot of changes going on in Cuba now, especially economic changes. Opening up, de decentralizing the state, having a, a, a greater number of people in self-employed uh, self people, cooperatives, uh, other activities are taking place, the right to buy and sell cars, the right to buy and sell houses, the right to renovate your house, credits easily being given to people in order to improve their situation, etc. Now, how did these changes come about? Was it imposed from the top? Was it just from the bottom? I think uh, I have a whole chapter devoted to the role of the Communist Party at the, in their Congress in 2011. What happened there was that the leadership in Cuba, this time specifically Raul Castro, he mentioned at one point in 2007, look, we have lots of problems. The only way to find out, a, to find solutions to these problems, if everyone meets in the neighborhoods, places of work, and educational institutions, and give vent to what you think the problems are, and what you think should be done about these problems. This was in July 2007, a call given by the leader of the Communist Party of Cuba. Okay? And people met, their millions, everyone literally participated in local meetings in which they gave their views on problems such as housing, such as salaries, such as health and education, how that can be improved on anything that under the sun that they deemed, thought were, was important. Uh, and how to deal with it. This was tabulated, and I interviewed people. This is documented in my book as well. All of this information was gathered and was fed up, fed towards the leadership of the party. The party eventually gathered all of these opinions from the grass, grassroots and worked out a series of what they call guidelines to bring in these new economic changes for, a, in, in a word, a more decentralized flexible economic situation for the Cuban people. And then they, they worked out these guidelines. These same guidelines were sent by the Communist Party of Cuba once again to the grassroots to have the input of the people with regards to these guidelines. And the guidelines came back. The vast majority of the guidelines were actually amended or changed. Some guidelines were added because the people felt that what some important things that, that were, were for, according to them, were on the agenda, were not on the, uh, the, on the agenda, and they should be. And, though, and thus, a new draft of the guidelines came into being. And then a, a Congress took place. The people were, delegate, were, were elected to the, as delegates to the Congress of the Communist Party of Cuba. They themselves also brought new changes. And a third draft of the guidelines was worked out and finally was adopted and step by step these guidelines were converted into legislation with regards to self-employment, housing, uh, and cooperatives, etc. So this is the Communist Party of Cuba. Far from being uh, an impediment to democracy in my view is, one, is perhaps the most vibrant uh, institution in Cuba that actually promotes debate and discussion on how to change the situation in, on the island. Now, how do elections take place in Cuba? In a short period of time, it's impossible to describe how elections take place in that country. For a country in which there are supposedly no elections at all, the basic general elections is seven months long. It's very long. I know. I, part I attended all of the steps of the elections. So I'd just like to do with, deal with one or two notions with regards to how elections take place in Cuba based on the 1976 uh, Constitution and since then reformed in various ways. Firstly, one has to discard the notion 
that the Communist Party of Cuba dis controls everything and they're the ones who nominate and elect people to uh, the different uh, 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 positions uh, in the state. In Cuba, unlike the United States, unlike Canada, all, unlike almost anywhere, and including unlike the Soviet Union, because when I did my research, I grilled people who were involved in that new constitution, who were involved in establishing the new electoral system in Cuba. Did you guys copy from the Soviet Union or not? And he, the guy, you know, I quote him in my book, he said, okay, I confess, I confess, this was three interviews with him in the parliament. I really grilled him on that because I know it's important for people outside of Cuba with regards to whether Cuba copied from the Soviet Union. So, okay, I admit, I was sent to the Soviet Union to investigate how elections took place there. So when we develop our electoral system, we would take things into account. They also sent people, for example, to the United States of America to find out about how the American system works. And what he told me, this, uh, this person in the Cuban part, what he told me was that they did not like the important role that the Communist Party in the Soviet Union played with regards to elections in the Soviet Union. So they eliminated the importance the, the important role, or the, any role at all, of the Communist Party of Cuba in elections. How do elections take place? First of all, Cuba electoral system is completely decentralized. So we have to think, we have to think differently. Very small constituencies, or what you call here, uh, districts, very, very small. So for example, uh, in order to nominate people to the municipal assembly, you would have a meeting, say, let us present, let's pretend that we're all in Havana now, okay, and that's a good time to go because they're, they're forecasting a snowstorm in three days, I think in two days, right here in, uh, in this state. The people meet either in the basement, just neighborhoods, in, in, just neighbors, in the basement of a, uh, in, in the ground floor of an apartment building or if, the, if it's in front of a house, on the street in front of the house. Approximately 100 people, not, you know, say, a bit like here, 100 people. Now how are people nominated to be elected to the municipal assembly, which is the foundation of the whole political system in Cuba? Let us take an example. For example, yourself. You have a right, you, know, you don't have to, you just, it's just pretending, okay? You have a right to present, for example, the person next to you to be nominated as a candidate for elections to the municipal assembly. By doing so, all you have to do is to say why you think that person should be nominated. For example, the person is very much involved in community work here. The person is involved in the student movement. She's a good student. She gets along well with her teachers and things like that. And she's a you know, very good person. We would like to have her in the municipal assembly. But you don't say whether she is a member of the Communist Party or the Communist Youth League, because that's not an issue. And the person here will accept or not accept. Then, for example, you can suggest the person next to you that I think this person should be nominated as a candidate to be elected to the municipal assembly. And the same thing, you have to explain why. And sometimes you have some very funny situations. Uh, for example, in the, especially in the countryside where it's more spontaneous. I was there at one point, someone said, I, would, I, I suggest such and such person. And then the, head, the person who was leading the whole nomination procedure would say, well, why? What, what, you, know, what, what, you have to give some reason. For, say, well, she's a revolutionary. Everyone broke out in laughter. Why? Because in Cuba, pretty much everyone considers themselves to be a revolutionary. But you have to give the reasons why the person accepts or doesn't accept. So let's say in this case, both of you were nominated. So, so far we see no party, right? And then what happens then? You have a show of hand votes between the two persons suggested. And the person who gets the most votes, say it's you, let's say you got the most votes, you are considered to have been nominated from this neighborhood area to run as a candidate for the municipal assembly. And the same thing would take place in, say, depending on the population, four or five other neighborhoods like that. And just please keep in mind that the only people allowed to participate in this our neighbors. Neighbors voting and suggesting other people as candidates who are neighbors in that same, in that same area. No one else. 
No party, no one from outside, no one being parachuted or whatever. Entirely different thing. By the way, in the Soviet Union, this never took place. It was a Communist Party who nominated, and that was the end of it. This is not the case in Cuba. And eventually, these things, this uh, nomination takes place. And how do elections take place? People have the right. Uh, before I, 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 I do that, well, I'll just finish this off. So then you have, let's say, two candidates in, this, in our case, and you have secret ballot voting. Everyone in Cuba, by the way, 16 years and older, has the right to vote. There are no restrictions. It's opposite uh, as to the case in the United States, where I detail quite a bit how voting, voting is restricted extremely in the United States of America. In the question and answer period, if someone is curious, I'll be happy to answer that. People vote. You have a choice between two. You have to vote for one of the two people. And then I was there when the votes are counted. The votes are counted publicly. Anyone can participate or can attend the voting. And the person who gets uh, at least 50% of the vote is considered to have been nominated, is, is considered to have been elected to the municipal assembly from that neighborhood. And we're talking very small. We're talking about an elected delegate to municipality represents only 1,500 people. To give you an idea how decentralized the Cuban system is, okay? Now, I don't want you to give the impression, I don't want to give you the impression, because that's not my goal and I do not do it in my book, that everything is so great in Cuba, that you know, this looks, I see this by the look on your face, people are generally impressed. You know, it's quite refreshing compared to our system. But this does not mean that everything is perfect in the Cuban political system. I do not want to give you that impression. I, I'd just like to read, uh, uh, there was a book review done of my book um, just a, a couple of weeks ago in the, uh, an Australian newspaper. And it says, I just read the one sentence, it says, however, the reader is never presented with a picture of an idealized social society. Some of the harshest criticisms come from my interviews with Cubans who support the revolution but are brutally self-critical. It's true, I do that in my book. I open up my pages of my book, not to those who are against the revolution, but those who are, support the revolution, but at the same time are able to think. They don't come from the Soviet tradition of incapacity to think, and where they, whereby they are proposing improvements to the political system. So I, I spoke to, some of my social political science colleagues there in Havana with regards to these meetings, uh, these nomination meetings, and I said, do you know anything? Do, have you noticed any negative features and all that? He said, yes. One person told me, who I quote in my book, political scientist from University of Havana, he says that I noticed in the, over the last few years, these meetings have, and not everywhere, but some of these meetings in some cities, in some areas, have become like a routine. And he says literally, and this is what I quote, he says some people go there just to get it over with. You know, it's their duty, they go there to get it over with, then they go home to watch the soap opera or whatever, which are very popular in Cuba. It doesn't mean that it happens everywhere, but this is a problem that exists in Cuba with regards to the nomination, meaning but at least people are discussing how to improve it. I asked someone else, another colleague of mine, why do you think that this routine is setting in or this lack of interest is uh, setting in to a certain extent in some areas? He says that one of the reasons is that people do not appreciate enough the role of these elected delegates. I said, well, how, why is that? He says, well, for example, when a hurricane takes place in Cuba, which is an important issue there uh, on the island, he says when a television camera goes to the areas which are affected by the hurricanes, they invariably would interview the local party secretary rather than interviewing the local delegates who do the vast, who do the important work along with the whole entire municipal assembly in order to prevent death in order to prevent this destruction of, of, uh, of houses and educational institutions, etc. So there, the point that I'm trying to make here is not to say that everything is great, nor am I uh, putting it down, but that there is important discussion taking place on how to improve the uh, electoral system in Cuba. I could just give you, in terms of nationally, 
uh, elections take place differently nationally. Once again, the party is not involved. However, I have noticed that in these elections, when elections take place nationally, up to a few years ago, the leadership of the party, the leadership of the mass organization, the, the overall political system would call on people to vote for all of the candidates, what they call a, a slate vote. You know, you have a choice, let's see, there are five candidates to vote for all five of them and not just for one, two, or three, or four. I investigated the voting tendencies and unfortunately, I'm the only one who has done so. No one in Cuba has done that. That's one of the, one of the defects of the Cuban system. They don't, up to now, they don't believe in analyzing voting trends as we do anywhere else in the world. And I discovered that the slate votes has been going down steadily over the years. And people have rather chosen, well, I want to vote for this person, but not the whole slate. So I spoke to uh, another Cuban colleague of mine and about this, and he had noticed the same thing. He, and he said, this is what I would call the critical revolutionary vote. That is, people are in favor of the revolution, but they're not willing to vote for everyone who is being suggested on that same list. So people are also discussing this, how to improve the selection and nomination of candidacies so people will be more prone to vote uh, for all of the people who are being selected. So this gives you an idea about uh, regarding the uh, elections. We, we finish in about another 10, 15 minutes? Another 10. 10 minutes, oh boy, okay. Well, what I will do then, um, okay, then, the question of how legislation is carrying out, carried out in Cuba, we deal with that in a, later on the question and answer period because I wanted to uh, deal with Venezuela as well in order to give you a perspective uh, on how to look at different notions of democracy. So we have the Cuban system, legislation is also carried out, just in a word, legislation is carried out, well I'll just put it this way to give you a proper um, perspective. In the United States, there are often fights going on in the Congress of the United States, right? Same thing happens in Cuba. To the extent that it's, it is often paralyzed, right? Now the Cuban parliament is never paralyzed. They have different ways of carrying out legislation. If legislation is not popular or is controversial, for example, at one point they, they discovered that they have to increase they had to change the social security law in order to increase the number of years that people have to work in order to get their pensions. Similar things happen in the United States and Canada and in Europe. This, you cannot say it's a popular measure. No one's going to say, oh great, I, I get to work another five years. No. So what they did is they worked out a draft legislation and they presented to the people and everyone discussed it in the place of work and in the neighborhoods. And it was modified and before it was actually adopted as a formal law. So people in this case were involved in working out the legislation with regards to Social Security. Other pieces of legislation which were very popular that actually came about as a result of the uh, 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 grassroots swell, a uh, 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 demand from the grassroots. For example, the need for self-employment. Self-employment, that were instead of the state being the owner of every barbershop and beauty parlor and all that, people should be able to open up their own barbershops and beauty parlors, to give you one example. This came from the grassroots. The same thing with regards to the right to buy and sell cars and houses. And in these cases, where it was popular and coming from the grassroots, the government enacted this rapidly as a decree law and put it into practice. So this is, there are different ways in which legislation takes place in Cuba. Uh, Venezuela is different. In Cuba uh, in the 1950s, they, the situation was changed through an armed revolution against the U.S. controlled Batista, Batista dictatorship. In Venezuela, the situation was, is different. There was a groundswell starting in 1989 when a massive revolt took place in Caracas and other cities in Venezuela against the neo neoliberal uh, um, uh, policies there that, that resulted in increase in gas prices, et cetera, in transportation. 
Uh, Chavez was a young military person at the time. He was starting to organize, but he did not yet have the movement necessary to take advantage of the situation in order to transform the situation in Venezuela. However, in 1992, he ordered, started to organize a new movement, and a, a civil military coup was attempted in 1992, which did not work. However, he came out of prison, continued to organize, and then he had the genius to think that it was not, the solution was not an armed revolution in Venezuela at the time, but rather it was important in order to oppose a two-party system which existed in Venezuela at that time, in the 19, from 1958 to 1998. It was important for him to be a candidate as, a, as president to elections in 1998. And he organized a party and a movement to support that candidacy in the December 1998 elections. In Cuba, armed revolution, but also against the two-party system controlled by the United States. In Venezuela, another approach, elections, using the same electoral procedure that existed in Venezuela, which was the foundation of the two-party system that exists in Venezuela for several decades. He won the elections in December 1998. Do you know what his main and only promise was at the time? It was, if I am elected, I will organize the Constituent Assembly in order to have the people involved in a new constitution. December 1998, he won the election, and when he was about to, uh, to swear allegiance as the new president in February 1998, he said, I swear allegiance on this moribund constitution, because that was the constitution that was in existence at the time, that I will be the driving force for a new constitution. That is what he did. The first thing that he did after being elected was asking the people in a referendum, do you, yes or no, want to have a constituent assembly in Venezuela in order to work out a new constitution? The vote, people voted massively in favor of that. They then voted in, uh, on a new constituent assembly, voting people to a constituent assembly, and finally a draft constitution, which was sent to the people, similar to what happened in Cuba, but not at all what happened in the United States in the 18th century, sent back to the people of Venezuela for their input, and majority of those articles were either, were either changed or amended, and new ones put into place for this new constitution. And what was the main feature of this new constitution, that new, new movement that came about as a result of elections against the old two-party system? It was to allow the people to start whittling away at private property in Venezuela, especially as exemplified by the oil industry in Venezuela. Venezuela being one of the main oil producers in the world. And for the first time, through this constitution and through this new movement, people were able, the government and the people were able to use funds from that oil industry funneled into the, for the well-being of the people in terms of health, education, social well-being, uh, housing, food, etc. for the first time. This is how things started to change in Cuba and in Venezuela. And I'd like to finish off on Venezuela. I don't really won't have time for the other two countries. I'd like to point out that I think Venezuela is an important laboratory, more than, 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 than Cuba and perhaps more than uh, Bolivia and Ecuador as well. On the following notion, I think for people in political science, it's worthwhile reflecting upon it. In Venezuela, you have representative democracy, right? I mean, there's no better example. They had 18, 19 elections since 1998 on different things. Lots of, lots of elections, and many, many of the voting procedures, the electoral procedures, is similar in a very superficial way to what we have in the United States and Canada, right? For example, two president, you have uh, uh, candidates for president running for elections and all that. However, in Venezuela, you have this representative democracy. But you also have, I would say also is not appropriate term, but you especially have participatory democracy. Remember when I started this short talk, I mentioned the importance of participatory democracy. That is, 
people having real effective control of the political situation. In, in Venezuela, you have participatory democracy in the following way. Firstly, when money comes from the petroleum industry, petroleum industry and it goes into health and education and other uh, projects for the well-being of the people, such as housing, whatever, the people are the ones who actually administer these funds. They are actually participating in how these activities are being implemented. Secondly, when a crisis takes place, for example, what's happening in Venezuela at this time, with the latest provocation by the United States in Venezuela, the people are on the streets every day defending what they call the, what, what the, their Bolivarian Revolution. There are no elections going on in, in Venezuela at this time, but people are on the streets all the time. So uh, what I say is that representative democracy is being absorbed by participatory democracy in Venezuela. That it, it's a sort of, uh, it's almost uh, non-recognizable. You cannot really call it a representative democracy. It is a participatory democracy, and representative democracy is only one small portion of it, but by far the least important part of the democracy that exists in Venezuela. In Bolivia, it was different. Uh, Evo Morales, as an uh, inheritor of 500 years of uh, the preoccupation of the indigenous people in Bolivia, won the elections in, uh, in 2008, 2005, and also once again against a similar two-party system and started to open up the country so that it could use the natural resources of that country for the well-being of the people. Ecuador is completely different. The beginning of what's happening in Ecuador now has its origins closer to Midwest United States. Why is that? Because Correa, even though he came, Rafael Correa, even though he came from a working class family in Ecuador, managed to have his education in a university in Illinois, in economics, and he wrote his doctoral thesis against neoliberal capitalist development. When he came back to Ecuador, he was a member of a neoliberal government, but he did not agree with their policies. He was forced to resign, and he formed his own movement, ran for elections, and he won the elections. And there, once again, Ecuador, a new constitution, constituent assembly, starting to whittle away at the all important uh, the importance of private property and using the natural resources such as oil in that country for the well-being of the people of Ecuador. So that is sort of a, a rapid uh, I say expose of three, four countries. I hope that you found it helpful and I hopefully, I'm sure I will have provoked a few questions or comments. Thank you very much. Five minutes. Oh, yeah? Open. Well, good. Right. So, the floor is now yours for questions about any aspect of uh, what he has laid out. I think, okay. So, you mentioned um, that, you know, the U.S. has kind of barriers to uh, participating in elections. Can you just list a few of those? Yeah, things? sure. That's, thank you. This is my favorite topic. <laughs> Uh, no, because I, I, I deal with it in quite some detail. Because in the United States of America, in terms of voting now, we're doing now, 2014, right? The United States of America has two types of crimes. One is misdemeanors, one year, right? You seem to know if you've been in prison or what? <laughs> no, it's a joke. No, it's a joke. Pardon? You get disenfranchised if you're a felon. Ah, great. Okay, he took the words out of my mouth, but if, I'll, 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 we'll, we'll deal with it together. He knows about that. You have misdemeanors, one year and less. Then you have felons, more than one year, felony, serious crime, more than one year. Now, United States of America, as you know, is the only country in the world where felons, those who have more than one year, not only do they lose their right to vote while they are in prison, which in many countries this is the case, it's a bit normal, but they also lose their right to vote for life. There's no other country in the world that has that. 
Now, in the United States of America, this model of democracy, where voting is sort of the epitome of the electoral system, one out of seven Afro-Americans have lost their right to vote for life. And in some states, because the states are the ones who actually apply these laws, right? One out of four African Americans have lost their right to vote for life. African Americans, of course, is, are, are the main victims, but they're also Latinos are important victims. Latinos, for many reasons, uh, cannot, do not register for, cannot vote because they're not citizens. There's all, we know there's all kinds of discrimination against Latinos with regards to citizenship and all that. But it's interesting to keep in mind that Latinos, okay, who um, ha have the right to uh, work, right to work, to pay taxes, to go into the American army, to kill and be killed in, American in the American army, but these same Latinos do not have the right to vote. So you have important sections of the population who do not have the right to vote. Now, I, I deal with, there's one uh, colleague in the United States, just to complete the response to your question, who deals with this quite specifically. He, he termed the, the coin voting age population as opposed to voting eligible population. Voting age population, that is everyone 18 years and older, who in principle should be able to vote in the United States, right? But because of these felony laws, this discrimination because of, uh, uh, against Latinos for their origins and all that, and other such causes, when Obama won the elections in 2008, supposedly the whole world was supposed to have been converted overnight through those elections. You know, do you know what percentage of the voting age people voted in 2008 elections? 58%. In 2012, it went down, 54%. So, you know, that's, it's not a very high, you know, you have, we're talking about 40% of the population who do not vote, either because they've lost interest, because they're fed up, with, as the Occupy Chicago said, this cynical notion, the lesser of two evils, or they're literally unable to vote because of the, this, this special felony law and all that. So, you, so as I write in my book, the, the suffrage rights in the United States of America, the severe limitation goes all the way back to the founding fathers when they established their constitution based on just a small minority of white, wealthy white slave owners who established the constitution for their own interests. I'm not saying, of course, things have changed, there's been improvement, there's been a civil rights movement and all that. But in my view, make no mistake about it, the state in the United States is basically the same as it was from the time of the 18th century. So that is my answer on the question of uh, suffrage. Is that, that good enough for the moment? Yeah? Okay. I'm sorry, I think you had a... Yes. Okay, well I, I would I would say is you know, don't look at me. I mean you could buy my book and have everything is exposed in my book. That's I have no problem with that at all. But I think that people should be able to work out their own opinions, you know, do their own investigation. What, what the question that you asked, when I gave a talk in uh, New York, uh, CUNA, uh, City University of New York, and there was a short discussion after, there's a YouTube on that, a, a student exa asked exactly the same question. She asked, okay, so how do we, you know, where do we get the truth? How do we know what's happening? Because as you say, there's two different narratives. There, what, not only me, I mean, lots of, I'm not the only one who's saying it, by the way with regards to democracy, with regards to Latin America, with regards to, to, to the United States. There are many academics, writers, activists who are saying similar things. I'm just one of the many. I think the most important thing is to look for alternative media. In terms of books, there's uh, publishing houses such as Zed, both myself and uh, Professor Prevo, both of us have written for Zed, which is a important, you know, offers important alternative publications. In terms of weeklies, what I, I like a lot, I don't know what others think if they read it. For example, Black Agenda Report, it's precious 
for the United States now. It's blackagendareport.com. You can't miss it. Just type in Black Agenda Report. Why? Because they, especially since the Obama phenomenon in 2008, and that whole controversy with regards to Obama, and the issue, for example, international relations, how there are more wars under Obama than there were under Bush. There are many other things like that. But the, what I like about Black Agenda Report, that they are resuscitating the progressive trend amongst African Americans that existed in the 1960s and 1970s. So they are emboldened criticizing Obama as African Americans, but from the left, from the progressive, which is really important because I think there's been so much pressure against people. If you, you know, a few years ago, if you would say, oh, I don't, you know, I don't like Obama, Obama's no good, it's, well, you're, you're a racist. I mean, that, but that's an important instrument in, by, through which, in my view, the United States operates. They create these auras regarding a person, and if you criticize them from the wrong point of view, in order to you know, stop any kind of criticism or any questioning, they raise the issue of racism and all that. Don't forget Obama. How was he manufactured? He was manufactured, I'm sorry, I have to come once again back to Illinois, by David Axelrod who was a media specialist from Chicago. His specialty was getting African Americans elected to be mayors in important cities. He was the one who worked out the electoral strategy to create the aura of change with regards to Obama. So one alternative is a Black Agenda Report. There's also the uh, magazine called Counterpunch on online. Excellent articles on Counterpunch. I don't know if you, what do you think? They really are great counterpunch articles. Uh, there are many others, but, and then if you, is there any people here who understand Spanish? Anyone? A couple? Okay. Uh, an excellent source is Telesur, telesurnet.tv. It, it comes from, it's based in Latin America, mainly Caracas, but from other countries in the world. If you want to know what's happening, not only in Latin America, but even the United States of America, and you understand Spanish, go to telesurnet.tv. Is that telesurnet.tv in Spanish? But if you don't know Spanish, just to watch Telesur on the internet is worthwhile. It's a great source. When there's so much disinformation going on with regards to Venezuela, what a great source. All right, you have some other? Yeah. What, uh, what do you think of the program Democracy Now? Uh, well, that's a complicated thing. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy Now. I, I mean, there's a lot of good things about it. Uh, but on certain issues, but we can't get into it now, it's too much. Like, like on Syria and Libya, you know, I have some doubts to what Amy Goodman has to say because she basically supported U.S. policy and with regards to Libya and Syria. But it, you know, that's, you know, we have to be open-minded. I think it's a good source of alternative information, <laughs> you know, along with the others that I've, I've mentioned. But there, there are quite a few, but I think, as I told the students in, in New York, I mean, it, 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 unfortunately, that is the only alternative we have, is to look for alternative media and build our alternative media. I think I spoke to one person who's in... Very limited, very, very limited budget. It's limited? Budget. Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's the freedom of the press in the United States. I was speaking, one person here is in communications, right? You're in communi well, this is a great challenge for someone in communication. How do we build alternative media in the United States of America? One other very good source yes. in Latin America is upside down. Oh yeah, uh -huh. yes. Upside down world. Just yeah. That, 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 yeah. That is, yeah, and also massive. for Vene on Venezuela now it's a very hot subject is Venezuela analysis. I, I don't know what you right. think of it. Venezuela VenezuelaAnalysis.com. Excellent articles on what's happening in Venezuela. There's a lot of confusion with regards to who's being killed and all that. They give the whole list in English of the people who were killed in the recent violence. Everything that's happening there in English, excellent alternative. I think I, if I have some time, I'll, I'll, I'll write up sort of a, a list of alternative media that could be sent out to people because people are, I'll just put it on my website, democracycuba.com. I'll put a separate thing on my website for alternative media because this thing comes up often. And unfortunately, there's no other alternative but for us to build our own alternative media because the issue of budget is, is an issue there. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I was just uh, talking about 
how curious, uh, how active are women in the Cuban political system? I saw, I looked it up in the index real quick and saw that you said it's up to 43% in the parliament. It's up, yeah. That it's still not where they want it to be. That's exactly it. That's also, okay, for example, what you read in my book is 43. I just, working on the Spanish version of my book now, and we're updating certain things. The, the percentage of people, women members of parliament, at now as we talk in 2014, it's, it's, close, it's over 48%. It's gone up since the English version of my book. It's now 48%. However, the comment that I made in that book still applies now. That even the Cuban people themselves say, like Raul Castro said, it's great that we have 40, 48% of the deputies in the national parliament are women. It's the third highest in the world, by the way. Where is the United States? 129. United States, 129. Cuba, third in the world. But Cuba has its own, has to have its own measuring rod. And what the Cubans say there is that while this is good, the number of women in the Council of State is not, which is the leading cabinet, if you like, in Cuba, is not as high as it should be. The number of women in decision-making positions in Cuba is not as high as it should be. So they are looking, as, as this guy wrote about me, that you know, they are their own harshest critics. They're, even though they've accomplished a lot, they, want, they, they know that this has to be improved in terms of more women in decision-making positions in, in, in the Cuban state, as well as in the different entities. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah? Sorry. I'll say another question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I know that, like, the, uh, you talked about the VAP, and that's, like, dropped extremely since, yeah. like, the 19th century in the U.S. Do you think, well, and what's interesting about that, too, is that you talk in there about laws like 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, uh -huh. women's suffrage, uh, civil rights movement, et cetera, um, but you explain that these groups of people, immigrants and such, continue to be disenfranchised. Yeah. I mean, I think in like the late 1800s, the voter turnout or something was like 75% of the population was very high. Yes. And now you say it's down like 54, uh -huh. 55. Is that because the people that have been given laws are still being disenfranchised? Yeah, I, I think there's several reasons why, the, why voting or has gone... people just are disillusioned. Well, them. that's it. I think you, 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 you got it right there, in my view. First of all, the disenfranch you know, the, the number, the incarceration in the United States of African Americans is on the increase. You know, it's an incarceration nation. The number of people, I mean, that's one of the main industries in the United States are, is prisons. So this is one reason. And also, the accumulation over many years of what the what Occupy Chicago said, the cynical notion, the lesser of two evils. When people are getting fed up with this lesser of two evils, when they know that there's no such thing as the lesser of two evils, they're, they're the same thing. So people, I think, as, as you indicate in your comment, people are increasing number of people are getting fed up, and the same thing is in Canada. You know, the number of people who vote in Canada is going down uh, extensively. It's around 55 percent on the national level. Now, if you take Canada, or United States, uh, the the question of that's why I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. It's important to consider when we talk about democracy, we can no longer talk of democracy in the abstract. And we're we have to talk now in 2014, democracy as real effective participation, that people can participate on a regular daily basis, not voting once in every four years. And because this is not the case in a country such as the United States, I am quite sure that the vote, the number of the people voting has, start, has gone down steadily because of the cynicism with regards to elections. And wait, this goes all the way back to, to Rousseau, I think, when they said that, you know, the, the democracy in a country which is based on private property is just reduced to voting once in every four years. So I think that this is one of the reasons that the voting has gone down. People are cynical. They don't believe it and all that. And there are other reasons that uh, specifically, such as the laws uh, uh, regarding uh, vo voting registration. I mean, voting, it's really, you, should, you know better than I do, but it's not easy to register in the United States of America. In many cases, it's complicated. And they add things on that you have to have an ID, photo ID. And many people cannot afford to have photo ID or they not easily get photo ID. There's all kinds of um, uh, handicaps. There are all kinds of things that are put into place that do not encourage people to vote. I'll ask you one other question. When, when does voting take place in the United States of America? Tuesday. Yeah, do you ever think why? Huh? Yeah, why? 
Huh? You have to work on Tuesday. That's it. How come this greatest democracy in the, in the world, voting takes place on a Tuesday? Same thing in another great democracy, Canada. You know? But in, in, in Cuba, there was no, it, it's not even in the law. It's normal. Voting takes place on Sunday. Same thing in Venezuela, Mexico. Bolivia, Ecuador. Huh? Mexico. Mexico, even Mexico, because they had a revolution there with a the new constitution a long time ago. Many of things which are still applicable. So there are many reasons. And I think that it's going to go down. You know, you had this slight upturn when you had the Obama phenomena, but now that's sort of gone stale quite a bit. And I, I already gone on record on the YouTube that the next president after Obama is going to be Hillary Clinton. Why? The first African American or of change, first women president. Anyways, if she gets elected, I'll have a short 30-second YouTube that was made about a six months ago, but that's, but you know, how, how often, how, you know, how, how often are people going to be, you know, caught up in this, you know, this thing about the lesser of two evils until there's some kind of a revolt against, as it happened in Venezuela. Venezuela is a good example. They had a, 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 a presidential election, a non-armed revolution against the old two-party system in Venezuela. It's interesting. When is this going to take place in the United States? Yes, that's um, right. So you had mentioned that um, private property um, is kind of runs contrary to um, the ideals of democracy. I um, mean, you're talking a little mm. bit about how they've introduced new rights, um, like you can buy and sell houses and mm. cars and, mm -hmm. and other such items. Um, and earlier today, the French foreign minister visited Cuba mm -hmm. to expand trading rights, um, and they've been entered into negotiations with other South American countries and now at the EU, do you see this negatively affecting Cuba? Because you mentioned mm. that voter participation was more seen as mandatory now rather than encouraged. Not mandatory, but there's, it's, there's a, it's some routine it's setting in. Firstly, just to clarify, when I say, talked about private property, I'm ta I didn't say private property, I said unlimited accumulation of private property. That, that is quite different. Okay. Unlimited accumulation of private property means the right of capitalists to accumulate as much as they want, and then fight amongst themselves who controls the whole society. Now, private property in a small level, for example, someone in Cuba who has, the, because everyone in Cuba are really owners of their own houses, it's quite different than in other countries. Majority of people own their own houses or their own apartments or whatever because of the uh, pol policies that were introduced in 1959, 1960. So if they have the right to buy and sell houses, it's, we're talking about very s limited, small, Property. We're not talking about unlimited accumulation of private property. The same thing with regards to cars. We're not talking about someone going in uh, to be a car dealer, but you know, people uh, selling and buying cars amongst themselves. There's another example uh, for uh, people who are in the countryside have their own uh, pieces of land that they can till, and they can even have uh, cooperatives amongst people who have their own land. But we're talking about relatively small property in a, at a very low level. Now, if the Cubans were soft on opening up Cuba to unlimited accumulation of private property, they would have done the following. If you recall, during my talk, I, I spoke about the uh, Communist Party of Cuba Congress and their policies that they worked out, sent back to the people for input and all that. Raul Castro said so textually, and I think I have it in my book as well. He said that we ex all of the accommodate, all of the suggestions were very good. We took everything into account except one. There was 15 proposals which would allow for the concentration of private property. He said we rejected that. He had the guts to say we rejected that because the United States probably didn't like that. But it just goes to show you we're not talking about the same thing. Unlimited accumulation of private property is one thing. But the expansion of private property in a small scale, people having you know, self-employment on a small scale, your own restaurant and all that, it's an entirely different thing. Because they're trying to, uh, to overcome a negative influence that took place when they were very much tied to the Soviet, Soviet economy. That is, everything was in the hands of the state, from the sugar 
industry, which is normal, but right down to the barber shops and restaurants and all that, which is, it's a disaster for an economy. You can't have an economy that way. And this is what they're doing now, but make no, and in order to make sure that while they're opening up self-employment, cooperatives, buying and selling houses and things like that, for example, if you open up a, uh, a self-employed business, say a restaurant, and you have four or five people working for you, okay? Now, in order to open up that restaurant, you, ha you have, the Cubans have worked out a system to try and keep things as equal as possible. I think this is what you're getting at, to, to make sure that the capitalism doesn't come back to Cuba. In order to open up your restaurant, you have to pay for a license, right? And then if you hire people, you'd have to pay a certain amount of tax on the salaries that you pay for the people. Be why? Because the people that are we working for in the restaurant, they got all of their health and education by the state over many generations. So it, it's, 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 it's a, it has worth in it, you see? And then when you sell your food, let's say I'm a customer, I come to your, your small restaurant in Havana or that, I buy a meal, right? I pay you for it. You have to pay taxes on the sales. There's several examples like that, but the idea is opening up on a local decentralized level, at the same time trying to make sure that this helps the overall economy and that it doesn't open the doors for a few wealthy privileged few who have a far better situation than the vast majority of the people. I'm not saying that it's working. I'm not saying that it's easy. It's too early. We, talk, we talked about a bit before we came here amongst the members of the faculty. Cuba is a, is a moving target. It's very, the situation is very complicated. They're opening up, at the same time they don't want to, as I think you're hinting at, they don't want it to come back to uh, the situation of, that existed before in capitalism. So it is a complicated situation, there's no doubt about it. Is that, yeah? yeah? Okay. Back on that two party question, I think it's, yeah. it's very interesting that the, the pattern of the countries you spoke of and you could add to it uh, some other countries in Latin America where there's been fundamental change in the last decade it's breaking with what had been a traditional two-party system. Mm -hmm. That, you know, mm -hmm. whether it was in agreements mm -hmm. that were like in the, in the case of Venezuela yeah. or in Colombia, um, or just long-standing practice of mm -hmm. the red party and the white party. Exactly. The Blancos and the Colorados. Mm -hmm. That real change happened when a candidate or party came in the mix and said, no, this is the alternative and really reached out to the people mm. that were fed up with the, with the old system. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the case of Cuba, that took the form of an armed revolution. That's right. But in recent times, it's either taken the form of street demonstrations mm -hmm. that brought down the old government exactly. and eventually uh, elections. So that breaking with the, with the two-party system has is, is really been a, a key feature of what um, revolutionary politics has looked like in Latin America. In the last, the last, last couple, decade. yeah. I think that's some... Especially the countries you, you've studied. Yes. Um, could you talk maybe just a little more, even in the Venezuela case, you mentioned what are some other institutions? They've also set up some kind of mm -hmm. parallel political institutions, yeah. even, even as there are elections of local representatives and city governments, but the, the, the national government is also allowed for other institutions which it then funds directly. That's right. Not, not only, I think this is one of the genius of, of Chavez, he knew that there was a problem of the old system, the old party, the old state there, there was still a problem of corruption. And there was even a problem, as he said, even amongst the Chavistas, that, those who, read, who wore the red Chavista t-shirt, but really weren't into it. They're into it more for their own pocket. So what he had established, he started doing this in the not too long after he was elected, was to work out, uh, uh, this is what you're referring to, communal councils. Communal councils on the local level. Communal council would be the ones who would get the funds, and through the missions, for example, you have a mission for health, a mission for secondary schools, a mission for universities, a, a mission for uh, unemployed or whatever. The communal councils are, would be the ones who would administer 
and assist the missions in accomplishing what they were set up to do. And the communal councils are sort of parallel to the municipalities. And they're working with these communal councils, working its way up to have communal councils integrated into communes. And they even have the objective to have communes being worked up even to the extent of having a, a, a parliamentary commune. In other words, he's working out a way, he's purposely, he, he was before he passed away, and I think Maduro is following basically the same policy, to work out a parallel system of the state in which people are directly involved, to, to get away from the old notions of, of governing. So that, so just to make sure that there's the old bureaucracy that existed before 19, uh, 1998, as well as the old manner of uh, doing things, that it's, it's replaced by these new structures. And I, I think just- and even in some instances, because um, actually Obama would probably like to be able to do this in a few states right now, <laughs> yeah. um, in which the local authorities Mm -hmm. Like this whole thing in the United States, it's about the expansion of Medicaid, right? You've got whole sets of governors, as you know, that are actually refusing to allow mm -hmm. open enrollment in Medicaid. Mm -hmm. the federal government in the United States can't do anything about it. Chavez, if he had had, see, because he had governors elected from the other party, mm -hmm. totally didn't support what he was doing. Part of it was that he was not going to let that happen. He was going to make sure that in every part of Venezuela, where there were these national government programs in mm. health and education, mm. that he would give the money from the federal government directly exactly. to the local councils. And so mm. even though one of his political opponents ran that city or ran that state, they could not block mm -hmm. what had already been decided upon in his view in the national in the Man. national election. That's, so, exact, that's exactly it. And not only would those people be blocked, but those opportunists within the Chavista movement right. would also be blocked. And I think the Venezuela, the Venezuela experience is really important. Venezuela is the first country to work out a new kind of a socialism after the fall of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union fell in the 1980s and then Chavez started his movement in 1990s and won the elections in 1998. That was the first experiment after the collapse of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. So the advantage with, of Venezuela is they're, they're not bogged down with the old mentality. Whereas Cuba, unfortunately, even though they did not, I gave you the example in the election, they do not at all copy the political system from the Soviet Union. But some of the old mentality is still there. It still exists in, in Cuba among some of the people there. But Venezuela is something fresh, it's something new. And I think that's one of the reasons they want to smash it, because it could have a lot of influence in Latin America. Yeah, and the Bolivian and Ecuadorian cases, which you didn't get a chance to get into, yeah. a lot of the same kinds Very of, similar. Of, of things and the, and the same kind of uh, uh -huh. a spirit of um, empowering the people yeah. directly and, and using the national mm -hmm. resources of, of oil, natural mm -hmm. gas, and, yeah. light, mm -hmm. and funneling those directly into a set of, of, uh, of social programs. Exactly, yeah. Any other questions? I think this is yeah, done. Yeah. Question here. Yeah, I was gonna, I, I'm just sort of, as you're talking about direct democracy, I'm trying to imagine what that would look like in the US, or, or yeah. let's say a third party candidate, like um, who's the, the Green Party yeah. presidential candidate. Yeah. I mean, gets, you know, just a fraction of the vote, but let's say someone like that does win. Um, it seems to me like our, you know, Chavez was able to hold a referendum on the Constitution. Yeah. That absolutely would not be able to happen in the U.S. It seems like our, you know, we're up against our, a, a our system is designed to stunt any kind of yeah. radical upwelling. It, it's true. Do what, you think that there's any potential that something well, like that? Well, put it this way. I'll take it. Firstly, well, what happened in Venezuela? The two-party system was also actually called the Punto Fijo Pact because it was worked out in a town, a pact, an agreement, whereby when one party was discredited, they would put the other party in power. It was really set in stones from 1958 to 1998. But who would have thought that Chavez or someone was able to go against it and establish something new? But at the same time, I can't stand here honestly and tell you that in the United States, 
it, it, it could easily be done. Like what you said, you, you took the words, you took the words, you said, what would it look like in the United States? If you recall the Wall Street movement, I'm not saying it's perfect and all that, but it, they had some interesting um, concepts to put forward with regards to the What did they say? They said when they were, people were occupying different public spaces and discussing things, working out projects, making proposals, they said this is what democracy looks like. It's true. This, this, I mean, that's it, that the people deciding. That's why I, I gave the example in 1959, 1960, 1961, Fidel Castro and the people said, this is what democracy looks like. We don't have to have elections. But in the United States, I'm not saying, we, you know, I, I, yes, you said the Green Party. In the United States, in my view, the situation is similar in Canada, you would have to have a massive movement, you know, some charismatic character person, someone who's really able to galvanize the people in the street, the grassroots, to, to irrespective of the roadblocks that you rightly point out that exist in the two-party system and their control, that is able to overturn this whole thing through elections. I don't know whether it could happen or not, I don't know. I, I, one thing for sure, I know the United States has far more power than other countries had before, such as in Venezuela. They also have, what is really important is the role of the media in the United States. Not just the incarceration, not just the prisoners, but prisons, but the role of the media, how deceptive the media is, is really a major roadblock to overcome. So uh, think of the case of Venezuela, though. I mean, in 1998, Chavez won the presidency. Right. without a single major media outlet behind him. That's an important point. And the only media outlet now that he has behind him, or Maduro now, is the state media. I mean, if you always have to be a little careful there, because if you actually have, and the same thing really was true in Bolivia or in Ecuador, mm -hmm. or even in, even in Brazil, when, mm -hmm. when Lula and the, and the Workers' Party won there, the media, all privately owned, supported the old order, the mm. old two-party two system. Mm. I think the one thing, rightly or wrongly, that Latin America has going for it is that these countries, it's not that unusual to change the Constitution. It's yeah. not that unusual. In other words, so mm. when a Chavez wins the election, or Morales wins the election, or Correa wins the election, the, the, the idea that they then go to the people and say, we're going to have the election of a constituent assembly. Um, that's a provision you know, of existing constitutions mm. in Latin America, which are more democratic than the Constitution of the United States, which is really a relic. I mean, no. that's, you may remember the huge controversy when um, which Supreme Court justice uh, suggested that the uh, South African constitution was far more democratic than the United States. Ooh. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh yeah, he said that. Interview, He's still said, alive. He basically <laughs> said the United States Constitution is far from the most progressive constitution in the world in, in the 21st century. Um, so you know that's another piece of that. Uh, yeah, I think what what, doc, what uh, Professor Pavel said there is really important in Latin America. You have that tradition of changing constitutions. You mentioned Mexico as an example that, you know, they did, the, or you did, I forget. Yeah, that's true. Now, United States, it makes me laugh, but it's not really funny. When Obama goes all over the world, he said, we have the oldest constitution in the world. He says, sometimes he says, oldest democratic constitution in the world, aside from the fact that the word democracy is not there. It's the oldest, it's a very old constitution, but don't you think it should be you know, the new one should be written, it should be reformed. Like this whole thing about gun control and all that, I mean, how can you have a constitution, a modern constitution in 2014, which gives the right, unlimited right, for the arms industry to, to build itself? I mean, what, you know, don't you think that this constitution should be changed? Maybe yeah. it's humorous about it. Benjamin Franklin, yeah. the Constitutional Assembly, and he yeah. himself says, this is not a perfect constitution, but I endorse it because it's what we have to do now, and it is my hope that future generations amend and change the government. As well, that's good. We should, we should quote Benjamin Franklin on well, that. Quote, but I mean, no, it's, but I mean, it's, it's a logical thing, yeah. but what he said, but, but uh, like, on the issue of the U.S. Constitution, I think it's an important point. Like, you know, the gun control, you know, 
The, there's the latest incident in, in Kansas. They don't in Kansas sit in Kansas. They don't even mention anymore that there's a problem with with guns. You know, he just said, "Oh, it's terrible. People should get together, healing and things like that." You know, there's so many killings take place in the United States. You know, and you know, I don't want to be too simplistic, but the problem is not gun control. The problem is that how come you have a country where the arms industry is able to flourish to, to an unlimited extent. And in conjunction with the arm industry, you have all the cultural industry, like the videos and you know, violent games, all that is able to flourish without any, any hindrance at all. And that is the cause of all these killings. Like, you know, I think the United States has some waking up. Like, you know how many American veterans kill themselves per day now? According, not me, according to them, 22 per day. There are so many problems in the United States with regards to violence. And, you know, you could have 22 suicides per day, and there's no revolt yet in the United States. Like, why should we be fighting their war? <laughs> you know, their wars. And, uh, excuse me, I got cut off because that's one of the things that really upset me a lot is the issue of gun control and the hypocrisy with regards to gun control. And right in the Constitution it says, you could have, you know, the gun control, the arms industry, here you go. You can do whatever you want. We promised to end at 9 o'clock. It's 9 o'clock. Yeah, so election for people for, for coming. Thank I you. Huh? Yeah, yeah.